Good morning. I hope you are all doing well. In today's sermon, we'll be looking at the unifying message of the collect, epistle, and gospel, and examine how they share a common message of action as we enter into the time of Lent, a season of preparation. Let us start by reading today's collect. Almighty God, who seest that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Consider these words from the Collect. We have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. In the Collect, we acknowledge to God that we cannot direct our own lives. If we listen to our own selves, we are without guidance. Consider the airplane flying. It orders its movements according to Polaris, the pole star of true north. If a pilot flies guided by his inner self, he soon knows only where he is at the controls and little else. Like the pilot who needs to know where true north is so he can orient himself, we need God's guidance to move towards our goal of eternal life. While flying my aircraft and instrument meteorological conditions, or IMC, I have to rely on the aircraft instruments as our bodily senses lie to us about our aircraft's true altitude. So, so too do we, so do we have to rely on scriptures for our guidance on the path towards heaven, as our natural senses will also lie to us for our true performance. That is why we cannot rely on ourselves to navigate towards heaven but we need the help of our spiritual navigator, the Holy Ghost. The first step of getting on the narrow uphill path towards heaven is that we have to first let him into our hearts in order for him to guide us. If we do not do this, then how can we expect to have him guide us if we are not open and ready to receive him and his guidance? We would be perpetually lost and would never make it onto the narrow uphill path towards heaven. This is why we need the help of the Holy Ghost to be our infallible co-pilot and help us guide us on the narrow uphill path towards heaven. Thus, when Paul tells us to keep our bodies under control of our minds and our minds to be God by guided by God only, he helps us move on course he tells us to avoid the things that can sabotage our journey towards God and can physically hurt both our souls and body. These things he lists out are things that would derail us if we engaged in these activities. We must seek not to do them and to instead remain on the course line that the Holy Spirit has outlined for us. This ties in very well with the Colic's request for God to keep us outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls. It links the theme of both spiritual and physical moderation extremely well. If we stay away from the things that would derail us, we will find our journey on the narrow uphill trail to be much easier than if we didn't stay away from those things. The Holy Ghost will help us to avoid these negative activities and moderate our spiritual and physical lives if we will allow him in and listen to his guidance. Being honest with others, and especially ourselves, is one of the most important things we can do. If we are not honest with ourselves to start, how can we be honest with others? The worst person to lie to is yourself, after all. For only by living our faith can we demonstrate that we in fact have faith. For professed faith with no action when you are able to act is not real. You must actualize what you claim to believe. We must put our nice words into action and not just leave them as words. 
We are called to be as God wants us to be, not as we would be without his guidance and help. God does this, not that we would miss fun, but rather that we would enjoy true happiness. Keeping evil thoughts under control can be a difficult task, but we do not have to face it alone. We have the Holy Ghost in our lives and other Christians and friends that support us and guide us that can help us battle evil thoughts. This is not about that we should be fighting alone, but with support from the Holy Ghost and our Christian and other friends. This proves that Christianity is not a solitary religion, but a social one. We will need help of our fellow believers if we are to succeed at the race of life. Of course, we need to be willing to talk to our good friends within the church about our problems and evil thoughts and listen to their advice, and more importantly, to the Holy Ghost advice to combat these evil thoughts and drive away the temptations of the devil. Christianity did not flourish because its followers were hermits. It flourished because its followers evangelized religion throughout the known world. It is an active religion, and it requires its followers to actively participate in it by spreading the good news. It would never have spread as far as it did if it were a hermetic religion. Keeping our thoughts under control can be almost impossible at times, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, it is not impossible at all. Matthew gives us a fine example of faith that demonstrates how we must be guided by faith in our Lord. The woman who cries unto Jesus is a Gentile just like us. Just like us, she longs for his mercy. In her case, she only asks for the mercy rejected by others, the crumbs of the master's table. This is the essence of our faith. We are not worthy to dine at his table, no more than dogs are meat to dine at our table. Yet what is left over is more than enough for us, and we are content with that, knowing what miserable creatures we are. And even more important, even knowing what miserable creatures we are, Jesus offers to share his table with us. This woman had just as much faith in Jesus as a faithful centurion. She had faith that he would share his mercy of her and heal her daughter. She was rewarded for her faith by him healing her daughter. The key in all these interactions that Jesus had with these people was that these people had tremendous faith in him. We must have that same faith and must show it in our lives by carrying out actions consistent with his message. He is not content for us to grovel for his crumbs. If he offers his love for, for us, should we not love him back by acting upon our faith? If you truly believe, you are compelled to act upon the faith you have. Action is the key cornerstone of the Christian faith. Jesus, after all, laid down his life for ours on the cross that we might have eternal life, the ultimate example of action. If he did that for us, it would behoove us to act upon our faith and follow his example of helping others and leading them to God. It is also important to understand that if one loves God, he still has the exact same amount of love available for any other person or group. His love is infinite. Even if it wasn't, love multiplies in use. We do not have to worry about God running out of love at all. There is more than enough to go around. Recognize how poorly you do with your own guidance, accept his guidance, stay on course, and accept the fruits of that action. Realize that you will make mistakes multiple times in your life, but what counts is that you turn back to God and do your best not to make that same mistake again. There is but one way to heaven. That easy to find, easy to follow, easy to hike path does not lead to the summit where eternal life in the real world awaits. Open your heart to the Holy Ghost. Use his power to follow our Lord to God who awaits in heaven. Time is now, not tomorrow. Time is come indeed. How you act 
It is by our actions we are known. Be of God, live of God, act of God.